Goku versus Luffy. It's a matchup people probably instantly dismiss as completely one-sided, but I ask you to expand your mind, dear viewer, and realize that under the right conditions, this matchup is actually a lot closer than you think. So, Goku. He is considered to be the absolute pinnacle of strength when it comes to fictional characters. He's so strong, people will compare him against anything in any context. You could have Tiny Tim beat cancer and some weeb will chime in with, yeah, but can he beat Goku though? Goku versus whoever is a dead horse that has been beaten to hell and back. But we're doing it again anyway because this is what it means to go even further beyond. Before we get started, there's already a fundamental flaw with trying to compare these two characters to begin with. Their stories aren't finished yet. Meaning there's probably some new transformation Goku or Luffy could pull out of their asses coming sooner or later that's gonna make them 10 times stronger than they currently are or whatever. Super Saiyan Infinity is coming! I can feel it guys! Dragon Ball AF is real! I don't know the future, so we're just gonna focus on Goku and Luffy at their current state in the manga slash anime. Also, FYI, for this video, I'm not going to use any power scaling terms like feats, FTL, low diff, or high complex multiverse level. First of all, using terms like that makes me sound insane. Second, it makes me feel like I deserve to be shoved in a locker, and that's saying something. So I'm just going to speak plainly, alright? Goku is the man to beat, so let's take an honest look at each of their power sets and determine if Luffy actually has what it takes to defeat the final boss of anime arguments. AKA the reason you can't get a second date. If you're already familiar with their power sets, feel free to skip ahead because I'll be going over the basics for people that don't know these characters super well. Or for people that would like a refresher. But there's going to be lots of funny jokes in there, so I don't know, maybe watch it anyway. Please, I'm begging you, I need this so bad, please! So, Monkey D. Luffy. He's made of rubber. How did that happen? Yo ho ho, he took a bite of gum gum. Yes, in the world of One Piece, there are special fruits called devil fruits that basically give you a superpower once consumed. They come in three different categories, Zoan, Logia, and Paramecia. The abilities these fruits give you range from mediocre to absolutely busted. Luffy ate the gum gum fruit, a Paramecia type devil fruit that transformed his body into rubber. Luffy can now stretch his body and distort his shape in all kinds of crazy ways. I should note that Luffy doesn't really use his stretchy powers like Mr. Fantastic or Plastic Man from Western comic books. In those cases, they mostly try to wrap around their opponents or make themselves bigger to scare off bears and large predators. Luffy generally uses his stretchy powers as a method to punch you from way over there. And that simple punch has stayed effective for 272 f***ing episodes, oh my god. Yes, episode 272, the first time Luffy demonstrates a new ability that isn't just normal stretchy punches and kicks, the gears. When Luffy shifts into a new gear, he gains new abilities and stat buffs, with some drawbacks in each form as well. Second gear makes him stronger and faster, but puts a huge strain on his body and shortens his lifespan. Wow, it looks and works almost exactly like Goku's Kaioken, what an odd coincidence. Third gear allows Luffy to transform one of his body parts gigantic and with equal power to match. That's a huge bitch! You can expand any body part, yes, including that body part. But once the technique is over, it turns him into a little kid, for some reason, and he's defenseless for a little while. Fourth gear turns Luffy into that, which gives him a huge boost in strength, speed, defense, the power to fly, and all of his attacks are named after King Kong. But again, once the technique is over, Luffy becomes exhausted and defenseless for like 10 minutes. Finally ending with 5th gear, Luffy's current strongest form. He literally says out loud, this is my peak. So I don't think Luffy is getting any more transformations or additional power-ups after this. 5th gear is probably one of my favorite transformations in all of anime. It turns him into an actual Looney Tunes character. He now has the ability to affect the world around him just like a Roadrunner cartoon. Turning objects rubbery and using them like a springboard, he can create objects out of thin air, grow to the size of a giant, grab lightning bolts out of the sky, he can give me an aneurysm trying to figure out what the f is going on in this shot. Ow. On top of all of that, 5th gear gives Luffy another huge boost in physical power. When Luffy enters this form, he's basically invincible while it's active. Once the time limit's up, you guessed it, Luffy becomes exhausted, turns into an old man, for some reason, and is defenseless for a while until he recovers. That's the end of the abilities unique to Luffy. But we also have Haki. For a quick rundown, it's a blanket power system everyone has access to in One Piece. 
Similar to how everyone has key in Dragon Ball, hockey also comes in three flavors. Observational hockey, basically a spider sense that can warn you of incoming attacks, and advanced users can see a few seconds into the future, like Tom Cruise that one time. Armament hockey, Nano Machine Sun. This allows the user to reinforce their bodies and weapons, giving them extra defense, attack power, and it also changes their skin color to make them do blackface, proving once and for all that racism can make you stronger. Advanced users can attack without directly touching the opponent, bypassing armor and tough defenses. Finally, we have Conqueror's Hockey. For a long time, Conqueror's Hockey could only instantly knock out weak-willed scrubs in a large area with a stank face. Later on, they made it so that advanced users could infuse Conqueror's Hockey into the Armament Hockey, giving users an extremely massive boost in power. Luffy can do all three types of this hockey, with all the advanced techniques as well. And yeah, that's about every skill and ability Luffy has under his belt. Current Luffy is a very powerful anime character. But how does that stack up to Goku? Okay, I think everyone knows Goku's deal at this point, so I'll try to keep this brief. In Dragon Ball, Ki allows you to basically do almost anything, from telekinesis to reading f***ing minds. So we're just gonna focus on the basic stuff. All you need to know is Goku is an expert martial artist, can fly, has super speed, super strength, teleportation, and can shoot energy blasts out of his hands and his feet that one time. Goku also has so many transformations, he can basically fill out an entire fighting game roster all by himself. Oh wait, he already did that. We got Goku, mid, Kaioken, Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, Super Saiyan 3, Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Blue, Super Saiyan Blue with Kaioken, Ultra Instinct Sign, and finally perfected Ultra Instinct. That's a lot of nuts! Each form more powerful than the last. Outside of Ultra Instinct, which to oversimplify it gives him an auto dodge, all of Goku's other transformations don't really give him any additional unique abilities. They're kind of just straight stat buffs. The dude is absolutely stacked. But how would he fare in a fist fight against Luffy? All right, the combatants are set and it's time for a death battle. But I have a secret to share. Everything I set up until now is kind of pointless in the face of one thing that has ruined so many battle shonen discussions, power levels. And Dragon Ball is the granddaddy and worst offender of power level bullshit. Think of it this way. As the show goes on, the stakes must get higher and the danger must grow with them. And that makes sense, right? If Goku defeated Frieza, you'd expect the next villain to be stronger than Frieza. But if the next major villain after Frieza was Raditz, yeah, of course Goku would feed him his own asshole. There would be no contest. The next villain must be bigger and badder than the last one, no matter how powerful the one before was. And while that makes sense on paper, Dragon Ball characters are already so powerful it quickly spirals out of control and it's impossible to even comprehend how strong these characters are actually becoming. I'll try to paint a picture as clear as I can. Luffy is nearing the end of his journey. He is about as strong as he is ever gonna get. Luffy, at most, could probably level a mountain or destroy an entire island. Now, let's take a Dragon Ball character like Piccolo. He blew up the moon way back in the Saiyan Saga, shortly after Raditz. We have a character capable of vaporizing the entire moon, aka much bigger than a mountain or island, and that was here in the Dragon Ball timeline. Look how much further we have to go. Now, I'm not done. Let's fast forward to Frieza. Frieza, in his weakest form, was able to destroy an entire planet much bigger than the moon with seemingly very little effort. And this motherfucker had three more transformations that multiply his strength dozens of times over. Goku defeated Frieza in his strongest form after becoming a Super Saiyan, meaning it's safe to assume Goku can also very easily blow up planets at this point. Now look again where we are in the timeline, look at it! Fast forward again, and we're at Super Perfect Cell. Cell had an attack called Solar Kamehameha. Apparently, an attack so powerful, Cell claimed it could wipe out the entire solar system in one blast. Cell is basically a Super Saiyan 2 at this point, and later Goku can become Super Saiyan 3, which apparently is four times more powerful than a Super Saiyan 2. I guess that means four solar systems now? And then we fast forward into Dragon Ball Super, and because the next villain has to be bigger and badder than the last one, Super Saiyan 3 now means f all to Beerus who defeats Goku with a shoulder touch. <laughs> hey.
Goku, through the power of prayer and letting Jesus into his heart, then turns into a Super Saiyan God, and can now fight Beerus on even footing. Their fight almost rips apart the entire universe. Goku is so strong, he can literally destroy the entire universe at this point. The absolute apex of strength. There is nowhere left to go after blowing up the whole universe. And this f***er still has like four transformations to go! Do you see what I mean? The reason Goku is the final boss of who would win in a fight arguments is because he is so incomprehensibly strong at this point, there is no one else that even comes close. Luffy is strong. He is very strong, but he isn't blow up the planet or rip apart the entire universe strong. No, Patrick, not even with the cartoon stuff that comes with fifth gear. Look, all the planet busting stuff is when Goku fires off a key blast, right? So what if he decided not to use them and just throw hands instead? Surely Luffy would stand a chance then. <laughs> In Dragon Ball, as your power level grows, so does your physical stats. There are many, many cases where someone is so strong that if another person hits them as hard as they can, it would literally do nothing. Just look at this man blocking a sword with his finger! The same sword that killed Robo Frieza like two seconds ago. There's even one case where Moro, a Dragon Ball super villain that was at least Super Saiyan Blue level of strength, broke their fist on Goku's massive pecs. Because Goku was that much stronger than him, Luffy can't do anything to Goku. Now I can already hear some people in the comments, and yes, there are moments when Goku is hurt by very mundane things when he isn't paying attention. Like Krillin throwing a rock at him while he's sleeping, or a rinky dink little laser that almost kills him while he's Super Saiyan Blue. I personally think those moments are total bullshit and a bad retcon, but fine, let's say under the best circumstances, Luffy is able to catch Goku off guard and hurt him with his strongest Conqueror's Hockey infused attacks while in 5th gear. I just don't think that would be enough to finish Goku off. Because Goku can take some serious punishment. He is constantly getting his shit pushed in, and I mean pushed all the way in. And he gets back up on his feet time and time again. And once that surprise element is used up, it won't work on Goku a second time. I just don't think Luffy has an answer for Goku. Not to mention his fifth gear has that time limit. Once it's up, Luffy is completely defenseless and the fight is basically Jover. Jowarida even. So there you have it. Can Luffy beat Goku in a one-on-one -on -one fight? No. <laughs> No. So why is there still so much video left? Well, it was pretty obvious that this was going to be the outcome if it was straight up just a fist fight. So I thought I'd make it a bit more interesting and expand the categories of this fight to even the playing field a bit. There will be three rounds in total. Best two out of three wins, but round one goes to Goku. Before we get into the second half of the video, if you're enjoying the video so far, consider dropping a like on the video. It really helps me out. We're pretty close to hitting 2,000 subs if you squint your eyes and also look at the wrong thing. Wait a minute, I don't live here. Round two, fight. Okay, we know who is physically stronger, but then who is the better main character? Someone that not only beats down the bad guys, but also has other qualities that make up an interesting, well-rounded person the audience can grow attached to. Also, I'm not talking about who is more iconic. I know Luffy isn't going to have his artwork featured in a Mexican restaurant. I am saying who works better as a protagonist in the context of their own stories. Goku and Luffy actually share a lot of DNA. Both are very dumb, happy-go-lucky dudes that love to eat a lot. Both are completely clueless when it comes to romance, although Goku canonically fucks. Whereas I'm pretty sure Luffy is asexual or aromantic or something. Maybe autistic, I don't know. Both characters can be very selfish. Goku with his incessant need to fight strong opponents, which basically keeps Vegeta and Frieza alive. Two villains that then went on to massacre entire groups of people. Oops. Luffy is also selfish, but in a more wholesome way, doing whatever he wants in the name of adventure and having a new fun experience. But it's never something that might lead to others being put in danger. No one outside of the Straw Hats, that is. Both characters stand up for their friends and get angry on their behalf, although I will say Luffy has way more instances of standing up for the little guy. Being kind to complete strangers because some asshole was treating them like shit and he punches the color off of them. Goku does that too, but mostly in Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Z and onward, Goku is usually not around or too dead to be helping the little guy. Both have wills of steel, able to endure grueling trials and tribulations for long periods of time without quitting. Although, Goku kind of puts himself through those tribulations. 
all in the name of growing stronger and becoming the best version of himself. Luffy does it for the sake of others. There's nothing driving Luffy to be the best. Becoming the King of the Pirates is his driving force, but that doesn't necessarily mean I want to be the strongest. He just wants to be king. Goku does have a lot of positive traits, but I think his negative traits wind up causing serious consequences for others and frustrations for the audience. Things like allowing Frieza to power up all the way so he could have a good fight, giving Cell a sensu bean, or not killing Majin Buu when he had the opportunity to do so because he wanted to give someone else the chance to defend Earth. This man really thought these assholes could stop Majin Buu? It's a string of bad decisions that could have ended the world several times over if things didn't work out the way that they did. Luffy also has his negative qualities. He'll fly off the handle when he sees some injustice happening in front of him, even if that means punching one of the most important people in the world and making himself public enemy number one. But he's usually justified in those moments and the audience is usually on his side. I don't think anyone's going to be calling him a bad father for 20 plus years. Both characters are inspiring to the audience in different ways. Goku inspires us to be the best version of ourselves and to never give up. Luffy inspires us to stand up for what's right and to not always live our lives in this box of rigid rules. And to constantly surround yourself with hot women that have massive tits, that's an important lesson too. All in all, if I had to choose one or the other, I think I'm gonna have to go with Luffy. There's a lot to like about both characters, but Luffy ekes out a win by being a bit more relatable and having less quote unquote bad qualities that would lead to audience frustrations and massive consequences for the story. Seriously, giving Cell a sensu bean drives me crazy to this day. Round two goes to Luffy. Fight. Okay, this is gonna be the most subjective round on this list, rule of cool. Who had the best finishers in their respective fights? The final moments of a battle where Goku and Luffy defeat their respective opponents with one last attack. Instead of just listing them out, let's make it even more interesting. I'm gonna narrow it down to another three round battle. A little battle inception, if you will. There will be three main categories, each one focusing on a different style or vibe of the finisher. Whoever wins, best two out of three, wins the overall round, and takes home all the Dragon Balls. For the first round, we're gonna go straight to the dick in the electrical socket. I'm talking going balls to the wall, hypest, most spectacular looking finisher. In my opinion, that's reserved for Goku's four times Kaioken Kamehameha and Luffy's Bajrang Gun. Both of these moments embody shonen anime at their absolute peak. In Goku's case, look at the colors, look at the lighting. These moments are so breathtaking. You look like Buzz Lightyear for a minute. For me, and I'm sure a lot of other people, this was their first instance of seeing a beam struggle in anime. A clash of two different colored energy blasts that destroys everything around it while you have a 1v1 tug of war match. Goku and Vegeta are evenly matched until Goku decides to push the win button and multiplies his power to times four, giving him the boost he needed to finally break the stalemate and blast Vegeta into the stratosphere. Hopping over to Luffy, I'll admit that most of Luffy's finishers are but there comes a giant fish! And this first finisher is no exception. Gum Gum Bajrang Gun is basically like one of Luffy's normal giant punches until you see how big it actually is. What? It's just an ordinary crabby- OH MY GOODNESS! Squidward! Look at the size of this thing! That's a huge bitch! Kaido answers in kind and becomes an even bigger Chinese meth dragon to fight back. This is the absolute definition of hype and spectacle. They clash in midair and have their own kind of beam struggle with hockey. Eventually, Luffy manages to break through and punches the color off of Kaido in a really spectacular looking finish, which also signals the end of this massive Wano arc. And by massive, I mean holy shit, make it stop! Now, while I think both moments are cool as hell, I'm gonna have to give the win to Goku this round. I think that it's just far more impactful as a hype finisher. It was something that defined a genre in that moment. I love seeing the extra energy ride up Goku's Kamehameha and slam into Vegeta's Gallic Gun. I love the changing color from purple to blue as Vegeta's about to be overtaken. And I love the impact of the attack finally landing and Vegeta goes spread eagle, completely helpless to stop it as he gets launched into space. It all works so, so well. Round one goes to Goku. Round two, fight. For the next round, this will be reserved for finishers that are far more subtle, ending their respective fights in 
serving as a way to show just how much stronger the protagonist is compared to their opponents. For Goku, that means defeating Raccoon with the people's elbow. Up until this point, Raccoon has been unstoppable, kicking Gohan, Krillin, and Vegeta's royal asses. No matter what they did to Raccoon, Raccoon would simply shrug it off with a Here comes the hurricane, bitch. 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 Katrina, Katrina, Katrina! That is, until Goku shows up. Raccoon manages to fire off a middle finger and starts charging up to use his ultimate attack before Goku just hits him once in the stomach, ending the fight right then and there. The Jobber is an extremely effective storytelling tool in shonen anime. Take a really strong character A and have character B easily defeat them, therefore quickly letting the audience know just how much stronger character B is without needing to build them up first like character A. And Raccoon fulfills this jobber role with dignity and grace. <laughs> Side note, Vegeta also fulfills this role a lot. <laughs> Switching over to Luffy, this finisher is very similar to Goku in that he defeats his enemy with one hit, but the buildup to it is much different. With Raccoon, we the audience are shown how strong he is by fighting several characters we know can hold their own in a fight. Whereas with Bellamy, we are only told how strong he is via his bounty. In One Piece, for all intents and purposes, a pirate's bounty is basically their power level. The higher it is, the more powerful they are. Bellamy's bounty is 55 million, which is decently high at that point. But we, the audience, know that Luffy's bounty is currently sitting at 100 million. Bellamy spends like an entire episode talking shit to Luffy and Zoro, spitting on them, mocking them, tiger meeing them, and smashing them into windows while the two don't fight back, leaving the audience more than a little frustrated. It's only until Bellamy steals from one of Luffy's new friends that Luffy decides to confront Bellamy. And after an admittedly pretty cool looking ultimate attack from Bellamy, Luffy finally shuts him up with a single blow. We knew Luffy was stronger than Bellamy, but we weren't quite sure how much stronger. Turns out Luffy could have destroyed him at any point but chose not to in order to be the bigger man. It wasn't until Bellamy mocked other people's dreams that Luffy steps up. He shows off not only his physical strength, but the strength of his character at the same time. Goku's moment is cool, but there is a bit more going on with Luffy's that gives him the edge. And for that reason, I'm gonna give the winner of this round to Luffy. Final round, fight! Lastly, we have which finisher was the most emotional slash personal for each character. Starting with Goku, we have the angry Kamehameha versus Frieza. This finisher comes after Goku decided to show Frieza mercy and gave him some energy after he got the two for one special. Watch out, Frieza, stay down! Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Frieza takes Goku's gift and literally throws it back in his face. Goku, furious at the realization that Frieza is beyond redemption, fires a one-handed Kamehameha, finally putting an end to Space Hitler once and for 14 episodes. Damn it! It all culminates with Goku making this face. It's not a face of anger or righteous indignation, but one of pity. Goku seriously tried to reach out to Frieza, even after all the awful stuff he did. He was the best guy around. What about the people he murdered? What so murder? Crazy. Up until this point, Goku has always been the first one to say that killing is wrong. Whether it be Raditz, Nappa, Vegeta, or the Ginyu Force, Goku always tried to spare his enemies after defeating them. However, with Frieza, his final attack made Goku realize that some people won't ever change and need to be stopped. Permanent like. I'm pretty sure after this moment, Goku is way more willing to blow someone's f***ing head off if they threaten her. We call that character development. Jumping back over to Luffy, we have Jet Gatling. The entire point of this arc was trying to get Nico Robin back. And after she says her most famous line, I was just wondering if you wanted to hang out with me and smoke weed and fill our bellies with diet soda and play Burnout Revenge for the PS2. Luffy decides right then and there to declare war on the world government, consequences be damned. Despite the impossible odds, Luffy challenges a seemingly unbeatable enemy, Rob Lucci. At one point, Luffy looks like he's about to lose, and honestly, he probably should have, but then the show would be over if he did. Won't be the last time this happens! Anyway, Luffy manages to pull one final attack out of his ass. Not only because failing means Robin and all his friends will die if he doesn't, but also to prove becoming Pirate King isn't some pipe dream. 
In one final attack, Luffy proves that the government isn't invincible and tarnishes their reputation in front of the world. It's an excellent finisher and a very personal one for Luffy. So there you have both finishers. If I had to choose a winner for this round, I think I'm gonna have to go with... Luffy. I just love Jet Gatling so much. Everything from the music to Luffy punching Luchi so fast, it's as if all his punches are landing at the same time. And then you can't even see his fist, he's hitting him so fast. Leading with the visceral scream the voice actors do to sell the attack. Goku's finisher is also very good, but at this point, the fight between him and Frieza is basically over already. Goku had definitively won. The resulting blast was Frieza foolishly throwing his life away over his bruised ego. It's short, but it's a moment that works because of Goku's reaction during and after the blast, and what it means for him moving forward. It truly is a great finisher. But still, I can't help but feel like Jet Gatling just works better in terms of storytelling, pure hype, and Luffy's personal attachment to it. Beating Rob Lucci isn't just some opponent that's in his way. He represents the world telling Luffy, no, give up on your friends and your dreams. Dreams. Luffy overcoming him is a victory in more ways than one, and in that case, I'll give the round to Luffy. <laughs> Yeah, there you have it. The winner of Goku vs. Luffy is Luffy. If you only care about who would win in a fist fight, then fine, Goku wins no contest. But if you wanted to take a look at these characters as a whole and really deep dive into what makes them so memorable and special, then I think Luffy deserves to take home the crown. And honestly, it could have gone either way. No, I'm not saying I think Luffy is better or more iconic than Goku, or that One Piece is better than Dragon Ball. You've completely missed the point of the video if that's what you took away from it. This was just for fun, and it's my personal opinion. I hope you enjoyed listening to me gush about two different anime that I love so much. So just take all that and remember, have a rotten day!